And now we will call Assemblymember Steinarth. You have, I believe it's uh, three bills up today. We'll start with file item three, AB 797. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, Madam Chair, if it's your, if, with your pleasure, may I start with the Assembly Bill 2093, please? Without, I'm without a problem. For my colleagues to join me. All righty, this is 2093, file item 16. Thank you. And again, I apologize for my voice. It's the, the benefits of our wonderful weather outside. I totally understand. Thank you. So Assembly Bill 2093 is an important measure to improve disability access throughout our state. While California already maintains a certified access specialist program, few business owners are aware of this service where a certified access inspector can come determine whether a property is access compliant. AB 2093 requires commercial property leases to include information about this CASP report. This will increase awareness of the program and encourage businesses to get an inspection. Doing so will also improve access while helping with businesses avoid litigation. The bill has strong coalition of support including the California Business Properties Association, California Chamber of Commerce, the Civil Justice Association, and the Consumer Attorneys of California. I'm joined by Matthew Hargrove with the Consumer Business, excuse me, the California Business Properties Association to testify in support of the bill. Interesting group of people on the same page. Uh, I, we're pretty congratulations. proud Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Madam Chair and members. That's a wonderful coalition to be sitting at the table and be a part of. Uh, the California Business Property, my name is Matthew Hargo with the California Business Properties Association. Uh, CBPA is very, very supportive of the Certified Access Specialist Program. Uh, we supported it when it originally came through this committee uh, many, many years ago. I believe it was an idea of the members of this committee. We still support it to this day. This bill will help raise some visibility for the program amongst uh, uh, building owners and leasing agents, and we hope that it will encourage uh, them to use the program more and make sure that their tenants know about it. We encourage and I vote. Thank you. Thank you very much. Other witnesses in support? If you'd step forward. There's the Civil Justice Association of California in support. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Bill Zelmer. I'm the president of the Certified Access Specialist Institute. We are the only organization that represents the CASPs here in California. We did speak with uh, Assemblyman Steinorth's office. Uh, we are impartial inspectors, so we're reluctant to say that we're in support of it, but that's what we'd like to say is we're not in opposition, but be things as it may, we're in support. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Got that. All right. So you're strongly neutral. We are <laughs> yeah. Got it. Very good. Thank you very much. Certainly positive. Appreciate it. Neutral. All right. Uh, any other witnesses in support? I don't note any opposition. Is there any opposition? All right. Seeing none, any questions, comments from? Right. Well, I'd like to say I think. Oh. All right. We have a motion. I want to. Just simply say I commend you for bringing all these parties together. I think this is a, a good start, um, perhaps a finish, but certainly this is, uh, I think, something where uh, we can reduce the concerns about uh, failing to comply with existing law by meeting this in a, uh, in a kind of an aggressive and yet uh, friendly manner by requiring that the information about compliance be right up front so that people aren't surprised. Hopefully that any violations or any need to uh, remediate problems will be handled. Uh, I happen to think the property owner should take responsibility, but to the extent that this is a negotiation so that nobody is surprised. And I think part of what we've seen in a lot of these instances is people are unaware that they have violated the law, and that is part of uh, the frustration. So hopefully we're going to educate people. They're going to know ahead of time. This is going to be a preventative tool. Uh, and uh, I, I thank you and all those who have worked together to make this happen. Uh, I think this is a, a very excellent uh, alternative and, and uh, provides hopefully a, a very positive step going forward. So with that, we have a motion. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. The motion is due pass to the Senate floor. Jackson? Aye. Jackson, aye. Morlock? Aye. Morlock, aye. Anderson? Aye. Anderson, aye. Hertzberg? Leno? Aye. 
Leno, aye. Wanning, Wykowski. All right, that bill has four votes, uh, but we will hold the roll open for other members. Thank you. And what bill would you like to take up next? Well, seeing my, my colleague is still absent, may I move on to 1867, please? Very good, 1867. That is uh, AB uh, 1867, file item 14, file item 14. Assembly member. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. AB 1867 updates the evidence code to allow courts to pre prepare electronic copies of certified prior conviction records. Existing law allows courts to prepare these electronically, but the document must have a watermark or electronic signature. Statute does not address the admissibility of a pre-existing paper record that has been converted to an electronic version. Many courts do not have the technology to use official watermarks or electronic signatures, or they don't have the extra resources to spend training employees on these procedures. It is easier said than done. AB 1867 redefines the statute to include identical copies or scans of certified documents as acceptable electronic versions without the need for watermarks or electronic signatures. The copies still excuse me, the copy must still be of a certified document with a seal or signature of the court to ensure authenticity. This will allow more courts to transition to electronic systems using resources they already have. I'm joined by Sean Hoffman with the California District Attorneys Association to elaborate on the bill and Dan Felizzato on behalf of the LA District Attorney. Did you get it right? Close enough. Is that close? Sorry, All right, Sorry Dan. Good afternoon, go ahead and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Sean Hoffman with the California District Attorneys Association. Uh, we're the sponsors of AB 1867. As the author noted, this bill does address the unforeseen lack of utility in the existing statute pertaining to electronic copies of conviction records. Uh, in order to take advantage of the law right now, the court clerk's office would have to affix an electronic signature or a watermark to the electronically certified document. Uh, that might sound simple, but the reality is that most court clerk's offices throughout the state, including those in Santa Clara County where this uh, the suggestion for this bill came from, right in the heart of Silicon Valley, do not have the equipment, the software, or the training to provide electronically prepared records under the method prescribed in existing law. Uh, as a result, a fantastic law that would help modernize court processes is largely going unused. So unless and until the court budget improves to allow for this to occur, or unless and until the courts around the state institute procedures to do this, the benefits of evidence code 452.5 will not be realized. It's important to note that AB 1867 does not change the way that records are currently being certified with an original signature by a court clerk and an original seal. Instead, it simply says that if a document can be digitized in such a way that it retains those indicia of authenticity, it may be presented electronically to the court. I think the Judicial Council's support for 18, AB 1867 speaks to the need for the legislation to address the unintended rigidity of the existing statute to create some efficiencies uh, in, in a time and paper consuming process. Um, <clears throat> AB 1867 focuses all parties in a uh, criminal prosecution on the key and important questions of, you know, what someone's punishment should be for the offenses they've been convicted of committing. Um, I'd note that this bill passed out of policy committee and off of the floor with unanimous support in the assembly. We respectfully ask for your aye vote. Thank you very much. Next witness. Madam Chair, members, Dan Felizzato on behalf of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. I just echo the comments of my colleague. Uh, this bill will just help increase efficiencies in Los Angeles County. We file you know, over 140,000 cases a year. Uh, this would just, having these documents uh, electronically submitted is not only easier, but it'll save courthouses much, much storage space. We support the bill, ask the committee's support as well. Thank you very much. Other witnesses in support, if you just step forward and give your name and affiliation. Madam Chair and members, Sharon Riley on behalf of the Judicial Council, we are in support of the bill for the reasons previously stated. Thank you. Thank you very much. Witnesses uh, in opposition. Witnesses in opposition. I know we did receive opposition. Do, do you have any, did you talk with the opposition? Have you removed their opposition as far as you know? Or they're just not here today. They're out flying drones in the hall <laughs> here. All right, I, I have a question. I'll bring it back to the membership. Um, 
makes sense to me. And I'd like the Judicial Council person, if she's, are you still in the room? Um, I know this is a concern of uh, other of my colleagues. Um, conceptually, this is a, a kind of a no-brainer. The concern is to guarantee that authenticity. You know, if someone is either falsely accused or a sentence is going to be based upon documentation that it turns out is not accurate or has been manipulated in some way, justice isn't being served. And we all want justice to be served. So can you tell me how you assure the authenticity of the documents? Madam Chair, on behalf of the Judicial Council, I believe that um, our committees have reviewed the bill as written, and they believe that it contains protections that would um, guarantee the our authenticity. I'll let Dan speak to it a little further. That'd be fine. Madam Chair. Uh, this isn't a trick question. Okay. This is just a concern I have. Sure. The documents, the original documents, they come from our, uh, through our CLETS system. Right. Um, I have never uh, even heard of anybody attempting, let alone being successful, trying to falsify a CLET database. Um, access to CLETs is severely restricted. And in our office, we have a thousand attorneys. There's probably less than a third even have access to CLETs. There's forms that are filled out that DOJ requires before somebody can enter into the CLETs terminal. There's a record that has to be kept, and you're stating what case number it was for and the purpose of running the CLETS record. So there's that paper trail that's in, let's say, the district attorney's office or the court's office. There's a copy of that at the Department of Justice. Um, CLETS printouts, they're, they're unique when you see them. Um, I just cannot even fathom how anybody could possibly try to falsify one of these documents, and if they did, you can simply go back uh, if somehow you, you were concerned about, let's say, the, uh, the, the paperwork, which I, I honestly, like I say, I don't envision, you would be able to go back to uh, that paper trail and say, okay, this was run, they have a unique number. Every time you enter into CLETS, a number is generated. You can go back and see what you know, the purpose of that was, and if you wanted to, you could simply run that record again and compare the two documents. Well, the, the concern, and I, you know, I generally, if the opposition doesn't show up, I, they must not be serious about their opposition, but this is a case now where we're talking about the potential for people to be, you know, to be deprived of their constitutional rights. So um, the, the, one of the uh, objections, or was an example, that was given, I don't know if it's accurate or not, but I'd sure like to get uh, your thoughts on it. And I know the CLET system and it's very protected. On the other hand, I know students who've somehow been able to hack into a school's uh, um, uh, information and change a grade from a D to an A. Uh, I think I just read that the uh, C or the DNCC was hacked by the Russians a few days ago. I mean, all sorts of weird things could happen. So the question or the, the letter, and I believe, do we have someone here on the opposition? Oh, good. Would you come forward? I don't want to put the people in support on the hot seat. You know, they don't, they don't like being in that position. So let's have someone who is in opposition to this bill and has written a letter. Why don't you let him, uh, yeah, get in. Um, Recently, a prosecutor in Kern County goes the opposition letter, falsified a transcript uh, of an interrogation to include a fabricated statement of admission of guilt by the accused. I mean, that's a nightmare. I don't know if it's real or not, but is that the kind of thing that could, in fact, happen? Or how do you envision this bill um, uh, not protecting against this kind of thing? Sure. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Ignacio Hernandez on behalf of the California Attorneys for Criminal Justice. Uh, and we are in opposition. Uh, as far as the example that we cited in our uh, letter, that, uh, that is an actual uh, case. The, um, the full story is that the uh, deputy DA uh, defended uh, himself in that situation, claiming that it was a bit of a joke, uh, that, that he likes to joke around with the public defender and they have that kind of relationship. Uh, but there was uh, action taken against that deputy, public, um, deputy district attorney for uh, marking up the transcript and making it 
essentially putting a fabricated, um, you know, a confession, and this was part of plea bargaining. And so, uh, and I, I can't remember what the exact outcome was, but I know that there was some, there was, uh, I think the State Bar might have been looking at it. Uh, but with that being said, here's kind of our issue. We understand current law was changed just, you know, two or three years ago, and we understand to try to keep up with the times of, with technology, and we, we respect that. We understand that. We also just want to make sure there are safeguards. The electronic watermark, electronic sig signature that current law allows now, would it, in my words, essentially attached to the document itself. So if it's transferred electronically, we at least have some comfort that the document itself, no matter whose hands it goes through, would end wherever it ends up, that electronic mark is essentially there. If I walk into Sacramento County Superior Court and I want to get a copy, a certified copy of a document out of a, out of a, re, out of a file, I can pay the $25, whatever it is, to get a certified copy, and then there is not a, a ink mark stamp, but it is essentially a, an impression stamp. So that way, there's no way really to falsify that. So no matter where I go, they can, you can feel if it's there. It, so we're looking for roughly the equivalent. That's what current law, the bill that was passed two, three years ago, that's what it did. It opened up that possibility. We see this bill as it's drafted now of saying, well, that would be good to have, but now we're going to allow this other option, which is essentially an email that's forwarded and then this, the electronic signature attaches to the email, but then when you print out the document, it's no long, there's no longer that direct contact connection. So we're just, we understand the concept, we understand the desire, we're just concerned that it may not have sufficient safeguards, and I don't know how we get there. The electronic watermark was, is essentially that safeguard, because it's actually on the document itself. Um, and I want to be clear, we're not disparaging prosecutors as a whole. We think it's a, it's a very, it's on occasion these things happen. I can tell you firsthand, my colleague over here and friend, I mean, we're certainly not saying everyone, but there have been examples, uh, you know, we've been running bills of, of DAs withholding evidence and the wrong person gets convicted. I mean, that happens. Um, I had a situation where there was a big fight in a case I was working on where there was a fight over whether or not uh, a report had been done and then magically a year after a year of motions later, magically the letter appeared. Uh, and again, there was nothing certified, just the date at the top of the letter. How do we certify when that actually occurred? I can tell you in that situation that if it was fabricated, and I have to be very careful about stating that, but let's just say hypothetically it was, they did a bad job because they put the wrong date. And so they actually dated it after when they should have, so it was clearly that something awry had occurred. So again, it's rare when it happens, but the impact can be significant. So I understand the goals of it, I just, we get very nervous unless there's something attached to the document itself, and, and that's why we're opposed to it right now. Uh, you wanna to respond to that? Well, only that the documents that uh, they are referencing aren't the the documents. Conviction documents. Right. And that's what um, we're limited transcripts, to. Transcripts, yeah. you know, they are, they're generated, I want to say in-house. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, your, your, your CLETS DOJ run is, it comes from Sacramento, uh, you know, your rap sheet. The defense attorney has a copy, well, at least I would say, in LA County, we provide the defense counsel with a copy of their rap sheet. I don't want to say anything in any other county. Yeah. Okay, well, that's, I, um, so if obviously if, the, if a document was submitted to the court that was different than the copy defense counsel had, there would be an issue, whether there's a watermark or not. In that case, the easiest way to solve it is to recess for a few minutes, run upstairs, and run a brand new copy to see which uh, document is correct. Um, I will state that, you know, in my opinion, if there's an issue with a, uh, a difference, I'm not gonna say I've never even seen or heard of anybody attempting to falsify a Kletz document. Um, I, would, I would think that honestly, the copy that defense counsel had would probably be the accurate because they're given, it, they're given that document in LA County at arraignment, so that document will be older than probably any other document generated for that case. Um, but like I say, I just, the documents that were referenced are not the conviction documents. Yeah. And that's all we're limited to here. Correct. Okay. Any other questions before uh, we ask the assembly member to close? Yes, Senator Leno. I'd be happy to hear Mr. Gonzalez's uh, response, but prior to 
the proponent's response because I had the same concern you did, but we're limiting this just to these documents. So unless there was an example that you could point to that would make your case for those documents, uh, I think we're okay. Otherwise, I was going to suggest since we're charting new territory, might we put in a sunset? We sometimes do that to come back and review it so many years later. But uh, it's for you lawyers to figure out because this uh, layman uh, doesn't know some of these intricacies, but I think it's been explained to my satisfaction. Okay. I, and I would agree, as long as we're limiting it to that particular document, uh, because there are, you know, there are just too many cans of worms that could open otherwise. So uh, I do appreciate that uh, clarification and do appreciate the opposition stepping forward, albeit a tad late. But um, with that, uh, unless there are any other questions, uh, Assembly member, you may close. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just to, to restate, prosecutorial misconduct is a crime. And, you know, I, I respectfully ask for your I vote. Thank you. Uh, do we have a motion? Oh, I'm sorry. Already moved by uh, Senator Morlock. Um, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. The motion is due pass to the Senate floor. Jackson? Aye. Jackson, aye. Morlock? Aye. Morlock, aye. Anderson? Aye. Anderson, aye. Hertzberg? Leno? Leno, aye. Monning? Aye. Monning, aye. Wykowski? Aye. Wykowski, aye. All right, that bill has uh, six votes. Uh, we will hold it open for the absent member. Thank you very much. We also have a third bill by Assembly Member Steinorth. And as you're bringing your members forward, uh, we have a consent calendar. Could we have a motion on the consent calendar? Thank you, Senator Wykowski. There is a motion on the consent calendar. Uh, Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Jackson? Aye. Jackson, aye. Morlock? Aye. Morlock, aye. Anderson? Aye. Anderson, aye. Hertzberg? Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. Monning? Aye. Monning, aye. Wykowski? Aye. Wykowski, aye. And we also uh, could use a motion. We heard file item two, Gonzalez on employment discrimination. Could we have a motion on that measure? I'll move that. Moved by Senator Wykowski. Madam Secretary, would you like to call the roll, please? File item two. The motion is due pass as amended to the Senate floor. Jackson? Aye. Jackson, aye. Morlock? No. Morlock, no. Anderson? No. Anderson, no. Hertzberg? Leno? I'm sorry, which File item two. two. Leno, aye. Monning? Aye. Monning, aye. Wykowski? Aye. Wykowski, aye. Five to four to two, uh, that measure uh, um, has enough votes, but we will leave it on call for the absent member. And I think that takes care of the items that we uh, have to uh, get a motion for that we haven't yet heard. So we now have file item three by Assembly Member Steinorth, which is AB 797. Here we are, starting from back to front, but thank you, Madam Chair. That's worthy of hearing. Thank you. AB 797, the Right to Rescue Act, will save lives. For 10 years, it has been illegal in California to leave your pet in a car in a harmful, hot condition. Unfortunately, many citizens don't know it is illegal, or even worse, don't realize how quickly it heats up inside a car. Every year, law enforcement receives hundreds of calls from concerned citizens reporting animals left in hot cars. Emergency responders and animal control do a great job responding in these situations, but sometimes their response simply takes too long to, for other priorities. AB 797 addresses the rare situation when law enforcement has been called and may be on their way, but an animal is in imminent danger of serious harm or death. In this situation, we must give citizens confidence that if they take heroic actions to save an animal's life while they wait for law enforcement to arrive, they will not be sued or criminally charged for doing so. In order to receive this immunity, a citizen must follow specific steps laid out in this bill. One, determine the obvious, that the door is locked and they cannot enter the vehicle without causing damage. Two, there must be a reasonable good faith belief that the animal is facing imminent harm. Three, contact law enforcement to report the situation. Hopefully law enforcement will advise them that they're on their way immediately. And if the rescuer decides to make the step to break a window to save the animal, he or she may not use any more force than is necessary and must remain at the scene with the animal until emergency responders arrive. This protocol ensures that vigilante activity will not occur under the guise of saving an animal. 
Only if each of these steps are followed and confirmed by law enforcement will a citizen receive legal immunity for their actions to save an animal's life. We hope that citizens will never need to invoke the immunity provided in AB 797, but if they must take action, they can rest assured that there will not be legal repercussions. Being stuck in a hot car is a serious danger to our pets, and my colleague Assemblyman Santiago will further provide testimony as to why this bill is necessary. Thank you, Assemblymember Santiago. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, we wanted to try this, and some of our colleagues as well as uh, Mr. Steinnorth um, sat in a car, and, and in a matter of about 10 minutes, you can easily get the about 120 degrees inside of a vehicle. Um, mind you that a, an animal cannot sweat like a dog. They don't have the sweat glands that we do. Uh, obviously, they have fur, so they they um, get heated up a little bit quicker than we do. And we had the ability to actually roll down the windows. Uh, it's it's really amazingly hot. It's surprising to me, quite frankly, how any animal um, could survive in that sort of heat. And in fact, um, particularly dogs, uh, when the doors close and, it, and the heat rises that fast, their blood actually thickens. Uh, which could lead to um, severe brain damage. And uh, certainly when we take a look at doing the humane thing in this particular case and changing the way we, um, we uh, look at the Good Samaritan laws that relates to, to dogs, uh, we took a look at some other states that had done similar things like Tennessee, Michigan, uh, Wisconsin, Florida, and uh, recently Ohio who have, who have changed laws uh, to allow this, uh, uh, this sort of law to move forward. Uh, and in fact, the uh, Right to Rescue Act would allow Californians um, to help hot uh, animals in hot cars without the fear of being prosecuted as long as they take the proper steps that were currently outlined uh, by my colleague. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, for the ability to present. I respectfully ask uh, for your vote. Thank you very much. Witnesses? Members of the committee, my name is Jennifer Fearing, and I'm here today uh, representing the co-sponsor of AB 797, the Humane Society of the United States, as well as the San Francisco SPCA and the San Diego Humane Society. And we thank Assemblymember Santiago and Steinarth, as well as their colleagues, um, Assemblymember Quirk and Senator Glazer, for their humane leadership. And we're pleased that this bill enjoys co-authorship of nearly 18 lawmakers, including Senator Anderson. Thank you, Senator. On June 5th, Salt Lake Animal Services responded to a call about an animal in a hot car around 2 p.m. An officer removed an unresponsive 15-month-old yellow Labrador from the vehicle and took him to a veterinary clinic where he was pronounced dead. The dog's owner was inside a business in the area and the owner said he had last checked on the dog at 10 a.m., about four hours prior to animal control's call. The dog's owner is now facing misdemeanor and possibly felony charges in connection with that case. Closer to home, a rabbit died last June in Vacaville when his owner went into the DMV and left him inside a hot car. A three-year-old chihuahua named Rosie was left in a car while her owner shopped at the Walmart in Vacaville a couple days later. The temperature inside that car was 117 degrees when officers removed Rosie. Rosie passed away shortly after that. Officers arrested the owner and booked her into Solano County Jail on charges of felony animal cruelty. First responders on the scene to rescue animals left in hot cars give pretty stirring first-hand accounts of the suffering that dogs left in hot cars endure. They describe claw marks left on the door by tra made by trapped animals and the contorted body shapes of those who are desperately trying to get out. They describe the look of horror on a person's face when they find that this happened to their dog because of a mistake, usually, and how the guilt, sadness, and remorse eats away at them over time, and how the emotions, public shaming, and legal prosecution destroy their lives. As was mentioned, five states have recently enacted similar legislation with bipartisan support. And as the Civil Justice Association of California wrote in their support letter, AB 797 would not protect gross negligence or willful or wanton misconduct. Persons who act reasonably when animals are illegally confined in vehicles should not face lawsuits. We urge your I vote on this common sense animal protection measure. Thank you very much. Next witness. Madam Chair, excuse me, Madam Chair members, Dan Felizado on behalf of the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. We are also pleased to co-sponsor this legislation. For over 10 years, our office has been conducting public service campaigns in Los Angeles County to make people aware of the dangers of leaving your animal in, unattended in a hot vehicle. Despite that fact, our office becomes aware of hundreds of cases in Los Angeles County alone where animals suffer and many die from being left unattended in these vehicles. <clears throat> As the assembly members noted, on a 70 degree day, the interior of a vehicle could heat up by over 40 degrees in less than an hour. As animals do not have the ability to sweat and uh, regulate the heat the way humans do. This is cruel. The legislature acknowledged that over 10 years ago when they 
made it a crime to leave your animal in a situation where they suffer or die. In Los Angeles County, we were made aware of a situation where an a owner left their vehicle unattended with a dog inside. A bystander came across the dog. Uh, we don't know how long the, the dog had already been in the car. The dog was suffering. He stood by, he called 911, waited for emergency services to respond. As he stood there, other bystanders gathered around the car. Everybody sat there, watched that dog suffer and eventually die because emergency services couldn't get there. It, I'll be honest, in, in special places like Los Angeles County, these are not gonna be the most high priority call for the LAPD the LA Fire Department. Um, so animal control does the best they can, but their resources are spread very thin. When emergency services arrived, they asked the bystanders, you know, why didn't you do anything? And they were told, we were afraid of getting sued or arrested. It's this fear of being sued or arrested that is understandable for bystanders not to take action. This bill will simply alleviate that need for that fear if they follow the steps outlined in the bill to rescue and save these animals. We think that it's both good policy and just the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Any other witnesses in support? If you'd please come over to the microphone, give your name, affiliation. Uh, Joan Gibson Reed, representing the Sacramento Council of Dog Clubs. We are in strong support of the bill. Unfortunately, it appears that some dog owners have lower IQ than their dogs, and they don't understand what they are inflicting upon their pets. So I think we're very um, happy that the author brought this bill forward. Thank, Thank you very much. We will not comment on IQs, if, but can't Adam argue Karen with members, you. Members, Joe Devine on behalf of Social Compassion in Legislation and Strong Support. Thank you. Katie Van Dines on behalf of Best Friends Animal Society and Strong Support. Thank you. Al Dassinger, Civil Justice Association. We support the bill. Thank you. Scott Sadler on behalf of the Humane Society Veterinary Medical Association and the ASPCA in support. Thank you. Catherine Doyle, Performing Animal Welfare Society and Strong Support. Thank you. Debbie Casey, also with the Performing Animal Welfare Society in support. Thank you. Paul Yoder on behalf of SHAC, State Humane Association of California, a supportive amendment, it's friendly amendment, it's noted in the analysis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Any opposition? My understanding is there's late opposition. Are you here? All right, apparently not. All right, so uh, at this point, we'll bring it to the membership of the committee, Senator Monning, followed by Senator Morlock. Thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank the authors uh, for bringing this forward. I, I think it's a good bill and I will be supportive. I do have a couple of questions on the immunity provisions. Um, it, as I read it, the immunity provisions are designed to protect the Good Samaritan who takes action to protect the animal. Um, if the animal being rescued or, or attended to were to bite that rescuer, would the rescuer have a cause of action against the owner of the dog for that attack? It's, well, if I could defer to a district attorney, but it, it's my understanding that no, they would not. With Not the chair's sure. permission? Yes, please. There's assumption of risk. Uh, yeah, if I gawk into your backyard uninvited and your dog bites me, I don't have a cause of action against you because uh, there's an assumption of risk. The same assumption of risk would apply here. You know, you're rescuing the dog, you're trying to do the right thing, but you're entering that vehicle unattended. And if the dog you know, were to bite you, um, You've kind of assumed that, that risk. Um, however, given the, the fact situation that we're laying out here, that that animal is in imminent danger of dying, uh, it's honestly highly unlikely that the dog will be in any condition to bite you. But if it did happen, there is an assumption. Right. Again, it's granted a hypothetical. The dog could be disoriented. Another variation on that scenario was the dog escapes and is hit by somebody else's car. Um, 
presumably that would protect the rescuer um, from so civil. As, so long as the rescuer is acting in a reasonable manner that the, mm -hmm. the, law, the legislation calls for the good faith belief and then that you act as a reasonable person would act. So if you do do that and there was a tragic consequence, I, you, as long as you're acting reasonably, you would be okay. Great, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, Senator Morlock. Uh, there was an incident in my district where the Lexus uh, was running and the owner of the dog went into the store and the air conditioner was on, everything was fine, but someone came by and busted through the window, not even realizing that the engine was operating. So how does this bill resolve that? Well, currently... Very quiet. Could be an electric car. I mean, we've just... We've got air conditioning going on, you know, maybe locked, you know, for the dog. But if you're starting to bust into cars, when when the the owner is done what they're supposed to do, I, I right, I, I understand. Thank you, Senator. Um, I I would just again refer to the fact that it is currently illegal <laughs> to have a dog in a car for the last ten years unattended. I understand with the. Um, the amount of electric vehicles that are out there, you could see more of that potentially. And there was a, a great little um, photograph that went around online where it was a poster of a person, you know, a dog in a car with a sign that said, I'm listening to my great music and I'm, I'm enjoying the air conditioning. But we would still remind them to any dog owner, if you're bringing your animal out and it's a hot day, please don't leave your animal attended. Take your, take your animal home. It's a crime to leave your animal unattended inside a vehicle. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I think also there's a reference the animal has to uh, be perceived to be in distress. Right. So if it's just hanging out in an air-conditioned Lexus, just <coughs> enjoying the day, that obviously is not a, an animal who views or appears to be in distress. So there are a number of different criteria that are... Well, that's amazing what some bills will generate in the form of emails. Uh, uh, I'm not surprised. So that was one of the, the, the things... We haven't it. taken up ferrets yet. Senator Monty. That would... Uh, it was like, what if the dog is fine and, and is doing what it's supposed to do, and that is protect the property of the owner? And so <coughs> it's a, it was a similar question. Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, once again, it, the legislation specifically talks about the, a, an animal being in the condition of, of Im, imminent you know, threat of death or, or suffering. So a an animal that, like I say, was... I don't know, alert, you know, protecting the vehicle um, would not qualify. If an individual tried to raise this immunity, they, it would not be allowed. Um, similar situation with, you know, say, if the vehicle in your district was running, the air condition was on, and the dog was otherwise not in any danger of suffering, um, this bill simply would not apply. And that individual could be charged both criminally and civilly, uh, or subject to a civil suit um, under those. Okay, so Mr. Filizato, what, what is the code section that I should refer my emailer to? Five, uh, 597, 597 of the penal code. Okay, then I will, I will do that. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Any further debate? Seeing no further questions, Assembly Member, you may close. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I respectfully I ask for your I vote. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Moved by Senator Anderson. Good call there as one of the principal co-authors of the bill. <laughs> Wondering where we're going to get a motion here. All right, um, Madam uh, Secretary, the motion is due pass to Senate rules. Please call the roll. Jackson? Aye. Jackson, aye. Morlock? Morlock, aye. Anderson? Aye. Anderson, aye. Hertzberg? Leno? Aye. Leno, aye. Monning? Monning, aye. Wykowski. Aye. Wykowski, aye. Right, that has uh, six votes. We'll hold the roll open. Thank you very much for bringing that bill, and thank you uh, for your presentations. At this point, we are going to go to Assemblymember Bonta's bill. 